Yeah, see you guys in a minute. This is kind of starting to stress me out, being a team leader, I'm not gonna lie. Everybody's a junk show, and I'm supposed to, and I'm a junk show, and I'm supposed to somehow be leading. Let me show you how it's not done. <laughs> Since I got into paragliding for the last, like, 10 months, I've been mostly paragliding. It's a flying off the mountain, oh my god! This is amazing! Yeah! I've become totally obsessed. I mean, there's nothing more amazing than circling up like a bird thousands of feet in rising air. We started calling it the sky crack because it was definitely, I could tell, I was like, oh man, this sport is addictive. Oh my god, this is insane! And I was talking with my buddy Matt Siegel. He was also stoked to learn. Beginning paragliding has been a wild experience for me. I've spent the majority of my life focusing on rock climbing, so I've kind of like forgot about what it was like to be a beginner. Matt as a pilot has been awesome for our crash reel. He's really served up the crash reel for us. You know, learning to paraglide, like you, you just have some sketchy moments, and I've had a couple. <laughs> I landed in a tree once. That was real sketchy. <laughs> the tree kind of saved me, because if the tree wasn't there, I would have like landed in the ocean, which would have been real bad. Matt and Cedar are very, very accomplished climbers. I mean, I've dedicated my entire life to climbing. Ah! I lived in my truck for almost 20 years. I've spent more than half of my life being a professional climber. I've eat, slept, climbed since I was a child. Yeah! We're both professional climbers. We are both unprofessional paragliders. <laughs> you know, we're beginners. Cedar and I, we're used to like getting scared, we're used to kind of being dumb. We're also both very go for it, put it all on the table people. We kind of needed somebody that was gonna see that and recognize that, but see that as potential. Henzi is our paragliding sensei instructor. <sighs> Henzi is, is one of the best. He's an amazing pilot. Wow. Henzi is a legend in our sport. Definitely one of the most adventurous pilots in the United States. He's totally a wing nut. He's known for like landing on top of mountains and stuff. He's, like, he's a sky ninja. I'm a professional paragliding instructor. I teach the most badass out there how to fly. I totally feel responsible for Matt and Cedar's safety on this, on this expedition. In this sport, you can't make a bad decision and then back your way out of it. Things can go bad really fast in the sport. When your glider collapses, you're just basically suddenly impromptu base jumping. People get hurt, people die, people do break their backs. The ground is hard and the sky is invisible and between those two things, some bad shit can happen. So you can get caught in a spiral. The energy that gets unleashed upon your body is quite impressive. All right in the bramble. So Cedar and Matt are at this really dangerous part of the sport where they're like super gung-ho, but you push it too hard in this sport and it can be really unforgiving. Very soon after Cedar learned how to fly, he started looking at big objectives. We came down to Mexico with the hopes of flying off of Pico de Orizaba, which is a volcano. It's the highest peak in Mexico. It's the third highest peak in the Americas. Our pie in the sky plan is to climb up there to over 18,000 feet, pull out our lightweight paragliders, and then fly off the mountain. It should be simple. <laughs> it's a pretty aggressive adventure to take on given you've got like six months of flying under your belt, for sure. You're gonna fly off the highest mountain in Mexico. I mean, most really experienced pilots have never done that. Just the unknown. No one had ever tried what we were gonna do. A lot of things can go wrong. At that kind of altitude, you have strong winds and turbulence. There's always the possibility that you could land out in the middle of nowhere. You get killed or maimed, but those are the kind of risks, you know. But we're going for it. We are going to Pico Arzaba and we're going to try to fly off of it. For climbing Orizaba, you base out of this town called Tlachichuca. I think I got it. Let me let's try again. Tlachichuca. 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 Tlach it just rolls off the tongue. Tlachichuca. No, 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 no. Tlachichuca. The quaint little town of Tlachichuca. God, that's f***ing hard to say, dude. Tlachichuca is just this town, like, basically at the foot of Pico de Orizaba. We cruised around through the market, got supplies. It's uh, my favorite brand, Tiger Head. Oh, wow. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. They're actually really nice. Yeah. Well, those are sexy, dude. Yeah, <laughs> we had a good weather forecast. We had our supplies. That's the mountain that we're gonna climb. It was like starting to look good. What could possibly go wrong? 
the forecast has gotten worse. There's now 40 with some clouds. 40? The winds were high. Okay. You know, our like weather window was looking more and more like a sucker hole. But we're here and we just have to try. So it looks like we're just gonna have to fucking Hail Mary it. If there's one thing that I've learned from years and years of climbing, it's that you just have to try because you never know. Hey, check this out. This is it. We're driving up to the mountain. Looks like we're definitely not gonna fly off of it. <laughs> we have succeeded at getting to the mountain. <laughs> We can make a movie about that one time that we made it to the mountain. It's always important to choose a very scenic location for your tent. We all went into our tents around 3 o'clock in the afternoon because we're planning on waking up at 10 p.m. to start climbing. Kind of tried to get some sleep, basically. Turns out it's really hard to sleep from 3 p.m. <laughs> until 10 p.m. Attempting to get some sleep, but it's not really working out. I think I slept for about an hour. Uh, the whole night, the wind was nuclear. Uh, we were just like, this is a freaking joke. Like, there's no way, like, we're flying off this mountain. Like, there's no way. It's like, impossible. I, I had completely given up hope of flying off Orzaba at that point. We're f <laughs> <laughs> But it's so easy to talk yourself out of something before you even try. It's 10 p.m. and it seems like we're really going through with this. In life, you just have to go and see. We're like, all right, like, I guess we're just gonna go through the motions here and like, start going. I think I got a solid 20 minutes of sleep. Should be good. Most people spend a few days acclimatizing for Pico de Orizaba, but Henzi and Siegel and I are um, implementing what I call the disaster style, <laughs> where we're just gonna go for it and hopefully not get too altitude sick up there. So eat before you're hungry, drink before you're thirsty. Hiking at altitude is just a slow and steady game, especially not having acclimatized. It's just like take two steps and take a breath. I mean, it's just hard to move fast at 17,000 feet. It was kind of funny for like Cedar and I being like two professional climbers. We kind of just bumbled our way up there with our team. Hopefully we don't need ice axes because I don't have one. Cedar broke a crampon. Cedar has a crampon malfunction. I've got prototype crampons. <laughs> Came apart, but it's all right. Yeah, I'm just gonna tape them together. F em. I already got paid, I don't need cedar. It's just kind of like a little bumble fest. The higher we got, the more work we got. My toes are cold, my toes are cold. Oh, really? I love that. Oh, yeah, and by the time we got to 18,000 feet, I think we were all reconsidering our disaster style of no acclimatization. It turns out also that when you're at 18,000 feet, your reasoning skills are seriously compromised. You know, I'm here. I got a smile on my face. I'm having a good time. <laughs> Matt was definitely feeling the altitude. And I'm way up here, smiling. <laughs> Not only like feeling the altitude a little bit, but we didn't sleep, you know? Like we were just like sleep deprived. Okay, here we are, hiking up the mountain. I feel like we might be going in circles. <laughs> It's like Blair Witch all over again. <sighs> a lot of us didn't really feel that good. Like I put on my extra jacket and that was like a big effort because you know, there's not much air up there and you haven't acclimatized. So you're just like, you put on your jacket and you're like. <sighs> Cedar was the first to summit. The reason why we climbed the whole route at night was for us to get on the summit for first light because that's when the winds are the calmest. It's really cold, it's pretty damn windy. I don't know. If but when we got to the summit, it was too windy to fly. Kept on being like, Henzi, what do you think? And he'd be like, mm -hmm. We're gonna let our sensei, Henzi, make the call. And we were just shivering on the summit together, just like, this is not gonna happen. We were nervous, and, and then by some miracle, right as the sun came up, it went from marginal to good. The sun rose, and it like blocked the wind. The wind totally mellowed. I looked over at Henzi, and I was like, well, what do you think? And he's all, it's good. As we like laid out our gliders, you could see the shadow of the mountain casting this incredible pyramid. Fucking moment of truth. It was really, really tense up there. Hey 
Maddie, how close are you? Kenzie pulls out his wing and it's like, okay, I'm good. I was feeling the altitude and I was just like, worked. Dude, you, you guys, I'm all fucking twisted up. I kind of was just like so flustered and felt just kind of dumb. I was really nervous, like getting into my harness and doing everything and just like triple checked everything. There's additional risk when you're launching from 18,000 feet. Everything happens a lot faster. The air is a lot thinner up there. If you blow it, you're taking a whipper. And not like a whipper on a climbing rope. You're, you're gonna die. You're not gonna get to walk away from that. I mean, we are still beginning paragliders, so it seemed like it was gonna work, but you know, you have to test your theory and you're kind of testing it with your life a little bit. Yeah. All right. Now double check your stuff, Maddie. Yeah. Look at your lines, are they good? And I was just standing there feeling like unsure if I was gonna be able to fly off the mountain. Ready, Maddie? All right, launching. And then the unthinkable happened. We pulled our paragliders up in the air, we turned around, and we flew off of Pico de Orizaba. Henzi took off, Cedar took off right after him. Holy fucking shit! Cedar and Henzi had launched, and I was like honestly having a hard time. You know, like I had a lot of doubts. Eventually, I was just like, okay, here we go. Cowboy up. Suddenly we were all in the air together, gliding off of the third tallest mountain in North America. I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. Just seeing this iconic peak from this perspective that few of any people have ever seen it from, it was a special, special moment. It wasn't until like I was like halfway done with the flight that I was like, we just did it. <laughs> like we're flying off the mountain. Less than a year ago, Cedar and I like had these ideas of doing this, like going and climbing something and flying off it. Throughout the whole process, I think Cedar and I both realized how audacious it was. When everything's working against you and you pull something off, that's just the best feeling. That's sort of what Orzaba felt like. It felt like a little, our own little miracle. Sometimes you can pull off amazing stuff if you just jump into the deep end and have to swim. Just because you're a beginner doesn't mean that you can't do something kind of exceptional and kind of great. Dude, that was, fuck, dude, look where we came from, dude. Look where we came from. Look at it.